Um, that's okay. okay. More symmetries or more universes. Now we can turn to a less controversial subject. <laughs> In fact, for me, for several years, this has been maybe the real question, more symmetries or more universes. And, um, and I find it's one that, that, that plagues me. Um, but it is what it is. Uh, it is wonderful to be here on such an occasion. Uh, to suddenly see all of, so many of Ricardo's students and postdocs and colleagues and collaborators all here together celebrating uh, Ricardo in what I think is 50 years at the Scuola. Really astonishing to think. <laughs> uh, for me, of course, we all have many collaborators. For me, I have to just say that it's not the right word for me to call Ricardo a collaborator. I think the right word is a physics soulmate, because in fact, it's three decades we've spent bouncing physics ideas off each other and working with each other, over 30 publications. And for me, it's just been a wonderful experience. And so I'd really like to thank you, Ricardo. It's been marvelous. By the way, this is taken, I think it was the late 80s in the mountains in Colorado. We managed to climb a peak, but only after Ricardo wasted about an hour looking for Porcini in the forests. <laughs> So, my personal view of uh, the last 40 years, the era of BSM physics, uh, I've divided it into two groups. There was the first quarter century, 73 to 98. 73 was uh, Party Slam, 74 was SU5. This was the era where we all knew what the problems were, uh, whether it was flavor or whether it was uh, the origin of the weak scale or whatever it was. Not only did we not know what the problem, not only did we know the problems, we knew how to solve them. You just introduced a new symmetry. We knew what the game was. We were absolutely uh, sure we knew how to play the game. In this era, I think it's fair to say that none of us working in it ever guessed that in 2013 we'd find ourselves in the present situation of the standard model plus nothing. I don't think that occurred to us. It never occurred to me in the 80s, is it? And I think that's true for most of us. So uh, that was the first era, 73 to 98. The second era, 98 to now, is an era where, for me at least, uh, I've really questioned whether, in fact, the new symmetries are the way forward. I hope they are. Probably they are. It's the, it's the golden thing that's worked for us before. So maybe we should be patient, and that's maybe the way forward. However, there were three amazing surprises from data that shook my uh, confidence. One was dark energy in 1998. Uh, these, this is the data from uh, the two groups that did supernova searches, the magnitudes as a function of redshift. And, and remarkably, uh, Weinberg had come up with an anthropic argument as to why uh, we might be seeing, we might be living in an era where there's a cosmological constant. Um, in fact, looking back at that 1987, I certainly don't ever remember seeing that paper. I was so sure all of this anthropic business wasn't, wasn't worth looking at. Didn't even look at it back then. In fact, so the argument was that um, we must have a certain number of collapsed baryons in order to have observers. And one can predict the size of the cosmological constant, depending upon whether you think you have to live in a galaxy of 10 to the 12th or 10 to the 7th solar masses. And it's around, uh, in fundamental units, about 10 to the minus 121. One or two orders of magnitude too big. So, uh, of course, since then, many people have, uh, or not many, a few people have come up with ways of understanding uh, that difference. But dark energy, why we happen to be living in an era where the cosmological constant is just dominating the energy density of the universe is really phenomenal. A second great thing that happened in this uh, era, in 1998 again, was neutrino masses. Uh, this, is the, this is the data, and you see that the muon neutrinos were suppressed as a function of distance traveled through the Earth. And, um, and of course, 
the presence of neutrino masses themselves were not a particular surprise. What was surprising at the time, and still is maybe, is that the neutrino mixing angles were order one. We never expected that. Uh, there's an anthropic prediction of the scale of neutrino masses that, in fact, if they'd been much larger than we observe, that uh, large-scale structure would have been suppressed by free streaming. Um, this is a, a, a plot from Tegmark, Vilenkin, and Pogosian. Again, the peak of the prediction is that neutrino masses will be about an order of magnitude larger than we see, but still it's pretty intriguing. The first hint that trouble may be coming from the direction of colliders uh, was in fact this paper by Ricardo and Alessandro, the light paradox. It seemed like maybe there was going to be a light Higgs boson and maybe the standard model was doing uh, surprisingly well. And indeed, we now discover that there is a Higgs boson and that it appears to be lonely. Of course, we don't know that. We don't know that there's not going to be lots of physics that uh, uh, is just, a, uh, just hiding and will nevertheless uh, complement the Higgs. But suppose that it is lonely. Suppose there's nothing else for electroweak symmetry baking at the TV scale. Maybe there's something else at the TV or few TV scale, but maybe there's nothing else that has to do with naturalness of the electroweak scale. Well, in fact, such a lonely Higgs was predicted by Agarol, Barr, Donahue, and Seckel. <coughs> And their argument was the following. We, we, we often said, and I'll be challenging this argument a little bit, that if you just let the weak, the weak scale scan in the multiverse, then if the weak scale was a little bit smaller than we see, hydrogen would be unstable. And if it was a little bit bigger than we see, the complex nuclei would be not bound. And in fact, uh, they argued later that we we're within a, uh, about a factor of 1.6 of this catastrophic boundary of these... Uh, nuclei being unstable. So these are, th are three really dramatic discoveries of the last 15 years. The cosmological constant, the lonely Higgs boson, and uh, neutrino masses with large mixing angles. All three of these could be understood by scanning of parameters in the multiverse where these three parameters are scanning, the CC, the weak scale, and the neutrino masses, and there's a probability distribution uh, giving you a probability force pushing you towards a catastrophic boundary. Most universes have large CCs or large weak scales or large neutrino masses, but in those universes there's no large scale structure, there's no complex nuclei, and the density perturbations are free streamed away, so you have to live close to the catastrophic boundary. Uh, I find it interesting that these three discoveries all have simple interpretations in terms of multiverse ways of thinking. Just imagine that the last 15 years were different. Just imagine that we now had measured that omega matter was 0.99 within a couple of percent. Imagine that it was actually much harder to see neutrino oscillations because the neutrino mixing angles weren't order one. And imagine that theta mu tau had ended up being close to the square root of m mu over m tau. And finally, imagine that in the succession of collider experiments at LEP, Tevatron, and LHC, we'd say discovered a technipion and a technirose and so on. Guess what? I wouldn't be up here talking about the multiverse. <laughs> I think I can guarantee that. So after this, uh, let me give you the outline of the rest of the talk. There's really two subjects I want to talk about. One is uh, a different view of the origin of the weak scale than the one that Agarwal, Barr, Donahue, and Seckel proposed. The idea is that the weak scale is being determined anthropically, but it's coming from Big Bang nucleosynthesis. Secondly, I want to think about the implications of the Higgs mass and talk about the possibility of intermediate scale supersymmetry with the Grand Unified Theory. Both of these uh, I've been working on recently, one with my student David Pinner and Josh Ruderman, and the other with Yasunori, who's sitting right here and correct when I make mistakes. Uh, so, an anthropic weak scale. After all, we're definitely interested in where does the weak scale come from. Well, we have to begin with the MEV scale. There is, by the way, if you're interested in thinking 
about anthropics. Anthropics is very old, started in the 50s in a way, but there's a remarkable paper by Bernard Carr and Martin Rees in Nature from 1979, which, from their perspective, just gathers together what they viewed as some remarkable coincidences, no, no, well before multiverse thinking. But for them, it was just mul uh, remarkable coincidences. Several aspects of our universe, some of which seem to be prerequisites for the evolution of any form of life, depend rather delicately on apparent coincidences amongst the physical constants. Well, four uh, apparent coincidences I find intriguing are these four. Here's the electron mass, Yukawa coupling times weak scale, the electromagnetic contribution to the neutron-proton mass difference, alpha times lambda QCD, the quark mass difference contribution to the neutron-proton mass difference, uh, difference of Yukawa's times V, and this is the temperature in the early universe at which neutron-to-proton interconversion froze out. That turns out to depend on weak scale to the fourth power over m Planck to uh, four thirds to m Planck to the one thirds. Clearly, fundamentally, these parameters are all extremely different, uh, especially the last. And yet, it turns out that all four of these parameters are within a factor of two of one MeV. Wow, that's pretty interesting. That's always struck me. It's really amazing. Uh, when I talked about the cosmological constant, the weak scale and neutrino masses, the origin of a prediction was that you had a scanning parameter and a probability force was pushing you up against a catastrophic boundary and the prediction was that you should be near the catastrophic boundary. Of course, if you have two parameters scanning, then that boundary uh, is a certain curve in the two parameter space and if a probability force pushes you up against that boundary, then you may run away. You may have a runaway behavior. So you may think you have a prediction. You may think you're going to lie along the, this line someplace, but you have the problem of a runaway direction. The obvious possible solution to a runaway direction is that there are two catastrophic boundaries and that the probability force is pushing you into the tip of the cone. So the most likely uh, observers are ones which lear live near the tip of the cone made by the intersection of two independent catastrophic boundaries. Let's think about flavor. Here's the quark masses. The quark masses, are, uh, the plot goes from a tenth of an MeV up to a TeV. Here's the, the third generation, the second generation, and the first generation. And of course, this hierarchical structure led us to infinite enjoyment of uh, flavor symmetries and trying to understand hierarchical fermion masses from symmetries. But maybe thinking that way has misled us. Overlaid on the same diagram, I point out uh, the two, two important catastrophic boundaries that apply to the lightest generation here. This is the hydrogen instability boundary. The lightest generation lay in here, hydrogen would be unstable. If the lightest generation lay here, there would be no complex nuclei. And the remarkable thing is, we're pretty close to the tip of a cone. That's really quite remarkable. Here it is blown up a little bit. This, uh, this is the hydrogen instability boundary. This boundary here is the boundary where complex nuclei are not bound. This boundary here is the, is the uh, boundary where complex nuclei, although they may be bound, they're unstable to beta decay. We're 30 or 40% away from these boundaries. That's pretty remarkable if you think that the quark masses vary over six orders of magnitude that we happen to be within 30 or 40% of two catastrophic boundaries. In fact, the same is true even when you vary the electron mass. So now let me vary the electron mass. Keep your eyes on, the, on, on this cone here. This is our universe here. Uh, this is the electron, uh, does it say what value of the electron mass? I forget whether this is zero or our electron mass. It's our electron mass. And let me increase the electron mass and see what happens to the cone. If I multiply the electron mass by five, our universe is wiped out. In fact, we're about a factor of two and a half away in electron mass from the catastrophic boundary of no hydrogen. And as the electron mass goes up, so... The, uh, so that cone disappears completely. So actually, it's really remarkable. There's two boundaries here, hydrogen stability, complex nuclei. And actually, 
those shape of those boundaries form a cone in 3D that simultaneously fixes M down, M up, and M electron. Now let's go back to the Agrawal bar discussion. The Agrawal bar discussion assumed that only the weak scale scan. So they started with our universe, and they noticed that if you increase the weak scale, you hit the complex nuclei boundary pretty quickly. So just scanning V is going up and down this line here. But I think that misses something important. I think that misses the fact that we lie close to two boundaries. If it was only V that was scanning, it would be an accident that would be, we would be close to two boundaries. So to me, this suggests that the Yukawa couplings are in fact scanning. So my view here will be that the Yukawa couplings scan, and these nuclear boundaries are determining the quark masses and the electron mass. But they do not determine the weak scale. The weak scale is the product of Yukawa couplings times the VEV. And this is what's determining the masses. Uh, it's also possible, of course, that the neutrino masses are scanning. It could be that a fair bit of flavor is being determined by the multiverse. The fact that we've got these large uh, mixing angles suggests maybe that there's scanning of the neutrino Yukawa couplings too. So the question is, what determines V? And my answer for this talk will be a helium boundary, question mark, because the truth is I have no idea. <laughs> okay, so there's a question mark there. What I do know is that if you just vary the weak VEV, keeping everything else fixed, here's our universe. Our universe has about 25% helium by mass. As you, and remarkably, we happen to be on a very, very steep part of this plot. We could have been way out here on a flat bit or way out here on a flat bit, but there's this exponentially sharp transition between all hydrogen and mainly helium universe, and we're right on that transition. And so the question is, could it be that the weak VEV is scanning? And of course, if it's scanning, we would expect most universes to have large values of VEV. That's the hierarchy problem. And so the probability force is pushing us in to the helium universe, and the number of observers factor is resisting going any further. Could that be the origin of the weak scale? We know that the amount of helium is related to the neutron to proton ratio at freeze out, which depends on the neutron proton mass difference divided by the freeze out temperature. And the freeze out temperature, remember, depends on the weak VEV with no Yukawa couplings appearing there. So this is why it could be that BBN is selecting the weak scale. By the way, the fact that we're in this odd position on the hydrogen to helium has been noticed ever since Carr and Reese back in 1979. It's not that that's anything new. What we're trying to do is to interpret it inside the standard model. In particular, I don't really remember seeing this formula anywhere, that uh, if, if the quark mass is also scanned, remember that the neutron-proton mass difference uh, is understood in terms of lambda QCD. And so one comes up in a, for a formula like this. This formula, I claim, is the formula that is the origin of the weak scale. It's a correlation of the weak scale, the QCD scale, and the Planck scale. Well, two big questions to do with this. One big question is, um, do we really need hydrogen? Who says that that's an anthropic boundary? How do we know we can't live in a pure helium universe? And of course, I'm not able to uh, prove that to you. Possible things that come to mind are the need for molecular hydrogen cooling to get the original POP3 stars which then uh, blew up and, and dispersed heavy elements. Of course, we need protons for uh, main sequence stars because uh, they're burning on, a, on the PP reaction. And you need hydrogen for water. All of these things seem like pretty uh, useful anthropic requirements. But by the time you're talking about water, things are getting pretty grungy. Uh, we have to start talking about what an observer really is. And I hate getting anywhere close to that question. So I cannot, uh, I, I'm not able to tell you that uh, helium universes are bad. Another question is, is it really true that uh, this picture is consistent if many parameters scan? In particular, could there be runaway directions? If, if I really scan the Yukawa couplings and the weak scale and they do everything together, am I sure there's not some runaway behavior? How about scanning other parameters that are involved 
with uh, nucleosynthesis, such as the cosmological baryon asymmetry? Well, uh, with David Pinner and Josh Ruderman, we've looked at, at these scans. We've looked at scanning BBN, of looking at BBN with, in fact, the quark masses scanning. So here we're scanning M up and M down. Uh, that's our universe here. This contour here tells us that we were, are a factor of five away from a universe that's 90% helium. So we're close to the helium boundary. Now, if you go to other places, that are allowed by nuclear physics, if you lived in a universe here, you would find that you were a little bit, a little bit further from the helium-4 boundary. You would find that you were a factor of 10 or a factor of 15 away from the helium-4 boundary. And so you might have thought, well, maybe I'd prefer to live here because uh, then the weak scale could be a bit bigger and I would get a little bit more probability and so on. But actually, of course, we don't know the probability distributions on these quark masses. So I think the net result of this plot that you should take away is that if you allow the down quark mass, the up quark mass, and the V to scan, there is no runaway direction. It is bounded. Our universe lies at the tip of a 3D cone in these parameters. That's not true if we let A to B scan. If we let A to B scan, a very, very interesting phenomenon occurs that as the baryon density comes down, the neutron-proton to deuterium reaction freezes out and you're able to shoot out to very large V and get uh, 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 a very large V universe without all helium-4. Well, this is no big surprise. Uh, this is the standard thing in multiverse physics. As you let more parameters scan, you get runaways. That happened to Weinberg with his cosmological constants. You let the size of the density perturbations or the amount of dark matter scan, and you get runaway problems. Whenever you get runaway problems, you want to look for new boundaries. Here's one possible boundary that might stop the runaway. If you have wimp dark matter, then as you change the weak scale, you're also changing the energy density in wimps. And that means as V gets bigger and bigger, you get more and more dark matter energy density, and it gets harder and harder for the galactic disks to fragment into protostars. I have no idea if this is right. Let me be honest here. We are just scratching the surface. I mean, I have the feeling whenever I look at multiverse physics that once you start varying the parameters, you're going into an amazing world where there's so much going on. And there's relatively few people who've explored this, and, and we really are just scratching the surface of what may be happening. OK, let me get to the second part of the talk, implications of the Higgs mass, grand unification with intermediate scale SUSY. You see, I'm a bit of a schizophrenic. I won't, I'm not going to give up symmetries. <laughs> Grand unification and supersymmetry are particularly dear to my heart. But it is true that the last 30, 40 years, the answer has always been, it's the standard model. And here's some wonderful plots. And I, uh, I see that a large fraction of the authors are in the audience. Um, the left-hand side shows the standard model cortic being evolved up to high energies. And the right-hand plot shows the phase diagram of the standard model at the Planck scale in the Higgs coupling top, Yukawa coupling. There's disallowed regions where the vacuum uh, lives, uh, is totally unstable. Here it's metastable, but lives long enough. Here there's no electroweak vacuum. And here we sit right here. This, by the way, is already zoomed in. We're looking only at a very small region around low couplings up there. And that's, of course, because the coupling is being sucked down to this low value. This is an amazing plot. I mean, this really is. I, I still can't get around my mind how none of us thought in the 1980s that it would be the standard of the possibility, that it's the standard model all the way up, that we'd be seeing experimental searches putting limits on particles of 1.3, 1.4 TeV, and it was just the standard model. But I've, over the last decade or so, I've been starting to think about the possibility that we're way off base, that our pure symmetry approach, symmetries for everything, was off base, and that we needed to have completely new thoughts, completely new directions. Here was one that I came up with Feldstein and Watari uh, in 06. We imagined that the Higgs-Yukawa coupling scanned 
and that it had a probability distribution pushing us this way. And we predicted that, the, that we would live right here. We said there'll be an enormous probability force. We'll live here. The Higgs will be 110. I remember giving this talk at MIT in 2006, and Nima was in the audience. And Nima politely waved at the end, but then he waved his hand up and said, but what if the force isn't, isn't that strong? Surely the force won't be that strong. Surely the force will just be weaker, and the Higgs will be 120 or 130 or something like that. And I said something like, oh, but then it wouldn't be convincing, would it? <laughs> and of course it isn't. This is a possibility. It's just not convincing. So what's another really way out idea? Another really way out idea is that it's high scale supersymmetry, that it's supersymmetry all the way up to the unification scale. And in that case, with Yasunori, we predicted that the Higgs mass was 128 with certain uncertainties, assuming an interchange symmetry between H up and H down forced tan beta to be one. Of course, as you see, the error bars have come down now. The one sigma error bars are smaller, so it's a little bit harder to, to live in this um, high-scale SUSY, although certainly it's a possibility. So what I want to talk about for the rest of my time is intermediate-scale supersymmetry. I want to take a different viewpoint. I want to look at this same curve and say, well, that's interesting. What's happening here? Why is the cortex passing through zero? And maybe the answer is that the cortex passing through zero at that point, because that's where supersymmetry is. Maybe supersymmetry is, in fact, at the intermediate scale. Now remember that, it, and I'm just going to imagine that the supersymmetric theory there is just the minimal, the minimal supersymmetric theory, minimal states. In that case, we know that we have an enormous amount of fine tuning occurring in the Higgs mass squared matrix to get an essentially zero determinant. That's the fine tuning which BBN is forcing on us in order to get uh, uh, the weak scale be acceptable for life. But if you look at this matrix and if you ask the question, what is the size of the cortic up there? Of course, we all know that the size of the cortic is g squared plus g squared, g prime squared over eight times cos squared two beta. But after enforcing this mass matrix to have zero determinant, the formula for tan beta is given by this. And maybe h up and h, if h up and h down are equal, of course, tan beta is one, but maybe they're not exactly equal. Maybe, tan, maybe this parameter here is between a half and two. But even if it's in that range of between a half and two, it still turns out that the cortic up there is incredibly small. 0.005 on this is, is just this much, right? 0.005 is very, very small. So we don't have to imagine even some special symmetry up there. In fact, if you just say that at some point the standard model gets supersymmetrized into a minimal version and that tan squared beta is between a, a half and two, then in fact, Supersymmetry is at the intermediate scale. That's the conclusion. Hmm. Well, let's now, go about, let, let's now think about one more thing that's dear to many of our hearts, the unification of the standard model couplings. If we look at the gauge coupling unification in the standard model and you blur your eyes a bit, you don't notice that it doesn't really cross, and you think, oh, that's pretty good. The standard model looks roughly like the three gauge couplings unify. However, we all know that you need big corrections. Uh, here, Yasunori and I have come up with new plots that, that I really love. Probably many of you have d done it, but, but, but these are the... What we're plotting here is two quantities. Rx is this solid blue line, and Rh is the dashed blue line. Okay? Rx is a linear combination of the three evolving gauge couplings, such that when Rx vanishes in the minimal theory, i.e. when it crosses the axis, that tells you the mass of the X gauge boson mass that causes proton decay. Okay? On the other hand, when RH vanishes, when this linear combination vanish, that's the point at which the Higgs triplet, the partner of the Higgs doublet, that's where that mass is. And you can see the problem in SU5 is, that, uh, with the minimal unification of the standard model couplings, is that MX is low. MX is less than 10 to the 14th GeV, giving you proton decay that's about eight orders of magnitude too fast. On the other hand, MH3 is only going to cross the axis right up here and give you a Higgs triplet mass that's about eight orders of magnitude above the Planck scale. So in fact, in detail, the unification of the standard model couplings doesn't work. This is a, a bit of a misleading plot. In detail, it really doesn't work. So how can we make it work with intermediate scale supersymmetry? 
Well, with intermediate scale supersymmetry, uh, we're going to have this superpotential, 5, 5 bar plus 5, 24, 5 bar, uh, is the simplest set of Higgs multiplets in, in supersymmetric SU5. And the mu parameter is just the difference of the two terms. V is the vacuum expectation value of sigma that breaks SU5. And of course, in the 80s, we spent years trying to figure out the, a natural symmetry solution to the doublet, triplet, splitting problem, as we called it. That's completely solved in the environmental way of thinking. Mu has to be small in order that there be a light Higgs. Otherwise, we can't break electroweak symmetry. So it's an anthropic requirement. You just have to pay the price of fine tuning. One thing we're going to do differently here is we're going to make the uneaten states in sigma light. So usually in SU5, you have sigma squared and sigma cubed in the superpotential. We're going to assume a symmetry forbids that, and we're going to have sigma squared and sigma cubed in the Kähler potential. That means that the uneaten degrees in sigma are at the Susie breaking scale. This is just like Judice Maziero. We usually do that in the MSSM for the mu parameter. Here we're doing it for the not for the field that breaks SU2, we're doing it for the field that breaks SU5. That now means that unification with intermediate scale SUSE is pretty good. What's solving it is the combination of the, uh, of the MX problem is the combination of the gay genos and the light sigma states at the intermediate scale now means that the X gauge boson mass is about 710 to the 16th GeV. So, that's not only safe, it, it's not that close to the present proton decay limit. In fact, uh, of course, what has to be stressed here is that we don't really know where the quartic coupling of the standard model crosses uh, zero. Could be 10 to the 10, could be 10 to the 11. If it's 10 to the 11, in fact, we'll be on the edge of proton decay uh, limits. MH3 is also solved. Uh, the, the, these states force this line to come down faster. Uh, but you still need a contribution from a dimension 5 operator. The dimension 5 operator here turns out to help you with MH3, but doesn't affect M MX. So this shaded band is telling you that a 10% uncertainty from this operator allows MH3 to be close to MX. So the message is that we've been thinking all along that to solve the gauge coupling unification, you needed SUSE at the weak scale. But I'm arguing that it's pretty simple to solve, SUSE, uh, to solve gauge coupling unification with SUSE at the intermediate scale. And that furthermore, SUSE at the intermediate scale, if tan beta squared is between a half and two, does predict the Higgs mass to be 125. What about dark matter in these theories? Well, there's various options, as always. One is that the, super, that is that the reheat temperature after inflation is much less than the scale of the superpartner masses. In that case, of course, supersymmetry has nothing to do with dark matter. Maybe it's axions. More interesting for us is if the superpartner masses are less than the reheat temperature after inflation and that we have our parity conserved. In that case, we're in danger of having much, much, much too much dark matter. And so environmental effects will, again, operate. And they will cause cancellations in the LSP mass to force the LSP mass to be much less than the intermediate scale so that we can get an anthropically acceptable amount of dark matter. And that leads us to two possibilities, we know dark matter or Higgsino dark matter. This is we know dark matter. We know dark matter gives you an X gauge boson mass that's even larger. And to get the Higgs triplet mass to come out, you need an even larger uh, dimension 5 operator. So the gauge coupling unification is, is still acceptable. It's just not quite so precise. But of course, TV scale we know dark matter is particularly interesting because this year it has been experimentally probed by the Hess collaboration, which was really a remarkable development that so rapidly uh, they come up with this limit. So this is the fraction of dark matter that's we know as a function of the we know mass. And for thermal freeze out, that's the predicted abundance. If all dark matter is we know you're there. And if you take an NFW profile for the galaxy, uh, everywhere above that line is excluded. So you'd have to have the fraction that's we know dark matter be less than about a quarter. Which for us is fine, by the way, because if we're up against an anthropic boundary and there's both axions and we knows, it's just fine for there to be a fraction of the dark matter to be uh, we knows. 
But of course, there's also huge uncertainties depending on what you think the uh, halo profile is. But nevertheless, I think that this is going to be a really interesting development if these experiments can be pushed further. The other possibility, this is my last slide, is TV scale Higgsino dark matter. Maybe the anthropic requ uh, requirement of not overproducing too much dark matter uh, instead operates on further fine tuning in the mu parameter. We already knew a fair bit of cancellation had to occur here in order to get weak interactions to break. Maybe there's further cancellation so that in fact the Higgsino is forced down to the TEV scale. If this is true, then actually the gauge coupling unification is now really precision gauge coupling unification. It's MSSM-like. Not exactly the same. If you look closely, you'll see that the mass at which the unification is occurring is closer to six or seven times 10 to the 17th rather than two, uh, 10 to the 16th rather than two 10 to the 16th. But it's very, very precise. You can see that both MX, the crossing here of MX and MH3 are both coming out the same. That's telling you that the gauge coupling unification is really precise. There's also the question as to whether this is already experimentally excluded. Isn't pure Higgsino dark matter excluded? Yes, it is unless there's a small splitting between the two neutral Higgsinos. And in fact, if the gay genome masses are given by anomaly mediation in this theory, you predict that the splitting in the Higgs genome mass is of order 200 kV, meaning that the prediction from this Higgs genome dark matter theory is that the dark matter scatters inelastically in direct detection. Let me conclude. So my conclusions are three surprises in this era from 98 to 2012. And to me, these big three surprises each appear to point in the multiverse direction. It doesn't prove anything. You know, the minute we discover a second Higgs boson, and that second Higgs boson is inextricably linked to electroweak symmetry breaking, then this item is totally gone. And we know where weak symmetry comes from, and it's not coming from... BBN, <laughs> okay. So, but nevertheless, that's not where we are at the moment. Where we are right now is it's the standard model and nothing else, and we've had these three amazing surprises. So I've also, that's led me to talk about the weak scale from BBN and intermediate scale SUSY. Uh, you can see that my title wasn't quite right. My title was more symmetries or more universes. And being greedy, I decided I wanted both. So in that sense, the two world systems, the chief two systems that we're about to hear about later this afternoon, I think, unlike the ones from centuries ago, these two are not in conflict. These two could both be operative, and they, they, it could be that we're exploring both simultaneously. I do have one last slide. <laughs> That's uh, Ricardo. So this, the, the last one was from 89. I think this one is from last year, just a few miles away up in the Apuani. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there questions? No, it's a question, but of course, if we discover an independent reason for the weak scale, wouldn't we have a problem, a remarkable coincidence that the anthropic argument that selects so finely the, uh, the weak scale also is given by something independent? I mean, couldn't it be really a, an incredible accident? Yes. Uh, if it's obviously true that if we can explain all of these parameters by symmetries, then for example, being on that sharp increase between a hydrogen universe and a helium universe would have to be an accident. Accidents happen. I mean, it's, su it, it's surprising, but accidents could happen.
that set all of these parameters. And that is quite remarkable that these dimensionless formulas have in them all these coincidences that make us possible. I mean, I, I think it, if, if we knew for a fact that that were true, I would immediately convert and believe in God. I mean, uh, in, <laughs> our, our existence would be hardwired in some incredible mathematical form into the underlying laws of nature. And, uh, uh, and uh, that's, that seems incredibly coincidental. I mean, oh, it's, I uh, right. Sorry, I, right. Did, I didn't mean to be against Oh, it. no, no, I, know, I think I was just clarifying what I thought Massimo was saying. It was not, it, yeah, right. Indeed, indeed, but, but, but anyway, just, just as a, at least in a, in a, in a minimal statement, uh, um, Right. But, but let, me me come back to, let me come back to Ricardo's question. God help questions. the church. You know. Ricardo asked a different question, which is how... No, but even if one accepts that, right, the problem will remain, right? The problem will remain. Yeah. Which are the issues that one can address in standard methods and which are the issues that one cannot? And uh, even if I accept the, the existence of the multiverse, I claim that we don't have uh, an answer to that. Absolutely. Well, except that, you know, one advantage, there aren't many advantages between, I much prefer to work on symmetries than the multiverse, by far. But the multiverse does have one advantage, I think. You know, with symmetries, you can invent, you, you can, it's just a pure invention of what symmetries you decide to invent. But you can't invent catastrophic boundaries. You know, you, can, you calculate the catastrophic boundaries from what we know. So, whether something has a possible anthropic determination is a question of whether you are able to compute an anthropic boundary for it. You know, people say we can't, there's no anthropic solution to why the charm mass is what it is, and that's because no one's managed to figure out an anthropic boundary where the charm mass is entering some catastrophic boundary. Um, but that always presupposes some some picture for what the underlying uh, what what the underlying theory is. It could be the underlying theory, for example, uh, some extremely simple theory of flavor with very few moving parameters, uh, such that by the time you make sure the bottom of the spectrum comes out right and gives you the correct things anthropically for the electron and the up and the down quark masses, it gives you VCB, yeah. right? So, so, uh, so that's, I think... Ema, uh, you're just like me. Uh, you want uh, symmetries and the multiverse. <laughs> <laughs> like father, like son. <laughs> <laughs> Two things. Uh, uh, one is, yeah, that's pretty crucial. Of course, everybody uh, 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 who thought about it knows, but just to make it come, that it's completely, uh, uh, absolutely no not incompatible concept. I mean, <laughs> anthropically, weak scale is required to be smaller than Planck scale. How to satisfy that anthropic constraint? Maybe the best way to have weak scale Susie. I mean, of course, absolutely no incompatibility there. And of course, whether that's the possibility or fine tuning in standard model is a better possibility, so far I have to rely on the experiment. But then what's the point of, being mad, of thinking about multiverse? Because if without thinking that way, you may kill the other possibility that it's just a fine tune. <laughs> Because you don't know. Because you don't know, you have to think about that way and have to explore, explore all the possible experimental consequences and have to rely on experiments. So far, of course, in the future, maybe lattice string theory calculated probability, blah, blah, blah. And the, the other thing I just want to mention about the Massimo's thing is that it's interesting that we did not have any over-constraint <laughs> in the past. For example, suppose you have a three catast catastrophic boundary, all of which we cross, and we have only two scanning or two even parameters appearing in that calculation. Then it's an over constraint. We never saw that so far because that's probably cross. To the, I, I don't know. I thought that that's what you were trying to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's a, that's non-trivial. Okay, this is a good discussion for the coffee room. So let's stop here. And uh, what time? 20 minutes from now.